Welcome to the Kentucky History Channel, where we strive to bring you all the Kentucky history content you want and you deserve. Kentucky is a part of all of us, and we plan on covering all the history we can, from Pike County to Fulton County, from Louisville to Harlan. Here on our YouTube channel, you can find many videos dedicated to different events, people, governors, and places in Kentucky. There's something for everybody. While you're here, if you like the channel, hit the subscribe button and the notification button so you get notified anytime new Kentucky history is available. And if you want to support the channel, we have a Patreon page as well, or patreon.com slash kyhistorypod. Welcome back to the Kentucky History Podcast. I'm your host, Jameson Cable, and with me, as always, is David Kirkpatrick. How are you doing? Uh, hanging in there. How are you? I'm doing good, and we have us a special guest here, Dr. Chuck Wels- Welsko. I got it right, right? Yes. I got it right. From the yeah. Kentucky uh, Historical Society, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to be here, and I'm excited to talk about the Civil War. It's a great day when I get to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you are the project manager of the Civil War Governors of Kentucky. If you're familiar with uh, this, the, with us, our site, the Facebook page, and so forth, we've shared a few things about it. Uh, if you follow uh, the Kentucky Historical Society, I'm sure people are, mm-hmm. are up to date on it. But uh, before we get into any of that, just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your Kentucky connection, and, and so forth. Yeah, so uh, I, as you mentioned, I have, um, I'm Dr. Chuck Welsko. I am the project director, project manager of the Civil War Governors of Kentucky at the Kentucky Historical Society. Yeah, exactly. I'll probably refer to it as CWGK as we go along, just because nobody really wants to say Civil War Governors, like that's a mouthful and it'll take up like 12% of our runtime. I got got my doctorate at West Virginia University uh, in Civil War history, 19th century U.S. history. Uh, My dissertation looked at loyalty during the Civil War. Uh, So I spent a number of years in in West Virginia, spent uh, a year in Georgia as a visiting professor, and position at KHS opened up in, in the before times, right? Right before uh, COVID. I shouldn't say right, right before, like a year before COVID. Uh, so I arrived to continue working on the Civil War in a public setting, working on the project. Uh, and it was wonderful. I got to come in and then the world kind of fell to pieces. Um, but yeah, I showed up in 2019 and got to kind of take over this project for Patrick Lewis, who was uh, the guy who hired me in. And then he left to go to the Filson. And I've been able to continue working and getting to just kind of spend every day del- delving into documents. Uh, but one thing I think about Civil War Kentucky right, is they never really make it easy on you. There's always something chaotic or interesting or nothing is ever linear, right? I studied kind of Pennsylvania and Maryland, Virginia and West Virginia for my dissertation and was like, I understand the Civil War. I have a PhD, right? Like I know what I'm doing. Showed up in Kentucky and I'm like, I don't know anything about <laughs> anything. And yeah, it was both like a bit, the process of like continually discovering cool new things is awesome. But then also the like humbling moment of like, oh, God, I don't know anything was was <laughs> equally like, oh, oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so that's a quick, quick kind of introduction to um, me and coming to Kentucky. Well, um, I uh, know the feeling that uh, definitely happens a lot when you're like, oh man, I, I really thought I knew about this, but you, you know, nothing. Um, yeah. well, uh, well, I'll, I'll throw a, uh, you know, nothing, Jon Snow, right? Does he, yes. does he make that one? All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, but that, that's, a, that's a pretty good, um, little introduction there. Um, but I, I kind of, the question that comes to my mind with, with the project, uh, because when I first saw this, I said, oh, this is great. You know, the Kentucky Civil, uh, Civil War governors of Kentucky, you know, a good time period, uh, a very you know, interesting time period and, and conflict for a lot of people who enjoy history. But b- besides that, like, how does this, how does it work with the historical society as far as this goes? When does this project end or is it, is there like a time frame uh, or how does that work just in general? And doesn't, I mean, just in any kind of project for the, yeah. the in that sense. So I think um, kind of like a, a brief history of CWGK, like uh, without like sitting down, right. And going, this is the from beginning to end, right. The intention 
at the Kentucky Historical Society is this is a long-term project. It started around 2010, 2011 for the Civil War sesquicentennial, right? 150th anniversary of the Civil War. KHS had in the past done work with uh, the University Press of Kentucky publishing selected volumes of governor's papers from the 20th century. Civil War, 150th anniversary, kind of I shouldn't say kind of, right? KHS was like, we need to do something more dramatic, right? Something that's a little bit more comprehensive than just selecting some papers. Uh, so CWGK really started first as a, let's, let's do this for the Cisco Centennial, but let's also make a big impact. Uh, and so the intention is, and this question is also scary, right? Uh, we've received a lot of like grant funding and support over the years since the project started uh, from the National Historic Publications and Records Commission uh, at part of the National Archives and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, and they, like, I always get scared when some of our grant funders are like, so when, when will the project end? And I'm like, never, the job stability. They're, they're, we have 10,000 <laughs> documents we've uploaded. Uh, we've got another 10,000 we wanna digitize and upload. Um, but the beauty of it is right now our focus is kind of 1860 to 1865. Uh, there's some potential right to hopefully go into reconstruction. A lot of the Civil War field is looking more in, at reconstruction in the aftermath of the Civil War, or as some historians would argue, right, the, the reconstructions or the, the events that come after the Civil War. Um, so I'm not saying that we're immediately going to hop to that, right? We've, we've got plenty of work to do. Um, that's a long answer to say. The project is going to has been here for a while and will probably be here for for many more years um the, it is a kind of tin pole project for khs gotcha gotcha yeah. um that's pretty good uh well that you know i i, I just kind of wonder about that because um <laughs> how that works how the interactions of, of say any kind of you know historical society in that sense how they kind of um come up with the ideas you know what 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 the lead is the basis around it and so forth. Now we got a question for you. Mm -hmm. We're gonna yeah. I'll, I'll ask it to you now, but this right. one you, you got to wait till the end to answer, okay. uh, because uh, at the beginning of the year we put out a podcast, a, a what if Kentucky mm -hmm. history podcast, and our what if was um, what if Kentucky had joined the Confederacy um, and seceded from. But that's a that's a loaded question. You don't have to answer it. Right now, because there's some other stuff we want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I love that question. Um, and I specifically love that question. Uh, like you'd made the Jon Snow comment, right? I'm a big yeah. nerd. Um, my birthday was just recently. And I I don't know if you've ever read Harry Turtle Dove. Um, either of you. He writes a lot of alternate history. Fiction, and, yeah. yeah. And so I've gotten back into that uh, from a gift from my brother. And it's just really like one of his things is right of the South had won the Civil War one of his series. And so like I've high school me is very excited at this question. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll chew on that in the back of my mind. So if my wheels are spinning, right, I'll kind of be thinking about that. Um, but yeah, no, that's exciting. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, uh, uh, sounds good. Um, uh, David, you got, you want to go ahead or with a, with a question or two? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think you guys have an outline that I don't have, so. But uh, oh, 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 oopsie! <laughs> I, I think we kind of look. I've mentioned Harry Turtle Love already. We are we are shooing the uh, the outline, right? So I'm, I'm happy to kind of take this in the directions we go. Whatever. No, I just see that but if I stray off course, you guys you know pull me back on. But I'm yeah. curious in the project itself. You mentioned the ten thousand documents you have uploaded. It, mm -hmm. People go to view those. What are they primarily uh, seeing? Are, are is this correspondence? Is it uh, government records like, you know, order books and that sort of thing? What, uh, what are people looking at? Yeah. So so the answer is, is yes. Um, and I think the way to unpack that, right, that's the short answer. Yes. Um, a better answer would probably be to highlight kind of how CWGK exists, right? We, we call it the Civil War Governors of Kentucky, uh, but that's kind of a misnomer. We, and I'm going to say that, like, I'll say a blunt statement, right? We don't actually care about the governors. We do. Uh, <laughs> We care more about the governor's office, right? We care about the governors as a lens to understand how ordinary Kentuckians experience the war. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, right, there are five Kentucky governors, three unionists, Brian McGoffin, James Fisher Robinson, uh, and Thomas Bramlett. There are two provisional Confederate governors, uh, George W. Johnson and Richard Hawes. 
was terribly afraid I was going to forget one of those five, like, and be like, I run this project and I couldn't remember them. Um, <laughs> so what we do is we use the governor's office as a lens to see how multiple things intersected, right? How did ordinary people live their lives? What happened when mobilization and military uh, maneuvers happened? What about guerrilla violence? Uh, what about their ordinary normal events uh, when they're fined for getting into brawls and gouging people's eyes out, or they're just drunk in town, or they steal clothes, or it's a lot of crime, it's a lot of booze. Uh, but also what happens about emancipation, right? As as Kentucky is a slave state, uh, right? It's got 225,000 enslaved individuals. What happens is the presence of the Union Army and changing federal war goals slowly dismantles the institution of slavery. The governors sit at the intersection of all of these things, right? They're dealing with extremely personal things. You're dealing with extremely bureaucratic things, appointing notaries in Philadelphia and California and New York City and Cincinnati, Ohio, right? And then, sure. hey, the gorillas rolled through and burned uh, this county courthouse. What do, like, I'm now fined by the county courthouse because I could, didn't have my liquor license. What was I supposed to do? The Confederates were occupying the courthouse. Um, so you get to see how people live their lives. Um, so, yeah, and the answer is yes, right? It's a little bit of everything. Predominantly petitions. Those are some of my favorite, uh, where you get to see people writing, again, about any number of concerns. Some of them are really mundane. Some of them are extremely important, uh, right? They've been fined by the local court, and they need to, or they want the governor to remit their fine, so they're, uh, right, they've been affected by the war, They so they can survive. Right. I have suspicious suspicions about how everyone in those petitions are poor men um, <laughs> and are like terribly afflicted and how that is possible for every single petition like clockwork. Um, but you get to see a glimpse of individuals' lives. And we take that a step further. Uh, so traditional documentary editions, like the ones KHS used to do on 20th century governors, would have footnotes, right? I don't know if you've ever looked at um, documentary editions, right? But they've got footnotes that kind of contextualize, add information about people and events. Uh, CWGK doesn't do that as much, but what we do is we lean into that technological side, right? The side that we're digital. Uh, you can see the original document and a transcription. And in many of those transcriptions, right? We're working on this now, and this is why there's this long life of this project. We're identifying every single person, place, and organization that shows up in those documents and creating biographies for them. Uh, they're short bios, and I've taken your question and kind of just run in a very different direction with it. Um, but they're short bios. I always refer to them kind of as like springboards to discover more about different individuals. Uh, so it puts a petition of 40 people who have signed it you can click on each of their names and learn, were they a farmer? Where do they live? And the occasional, we didn't find any information about this person because they don't exist in any record. Uh, but you get a glimpse at who these people are and it hopefully will help people who are researching families, writing dissertations, just generally interested in Civil War Kentucky, right? Um, doing yeah. research in any manner to learn more about the people that are in these documents. And that kind of takes me back right to that I don't really care about the governors because I care about the people that are in these documents. Yeah, that, that's a very a, circular answer. <laughs> no, but it's, it's fascinating though, because it, it puts me in mind of, of, there's a book called by tens and by twos. Okay. That uh, documents the Confederate March of Kentucky. And it's mm -hmm. sort of a micro history in that same way. It documents every place that they traveled because mm -hmm. it, it allows you to fill in the gaps of, of yeah. what the encyclopedia or some of these larger histories would give you. So it, it fills in the gap some. It allows people to track maybe some of the, the nuance or some of the people who have not had their experiences voiced in the past. So I think that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. No, and I think I like that idea, like filling in the gaps, right? Like I, my team and and people at KHS, right? When we when we work on the project, we don't. I don't ever come at it like I know everything in this document or I know everything about these people, right? They they are opportunities for individual other people to come in and, and learn more and find more out about Civil War Kentucky and and hopefully that carries them on their journey somewhere else. Uh, whether it's into filling out a family history, a larger project, something something along those lines. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think that, that I think that's great too. I mean it kind of adheres to some of the stuff that um, you know we talk about. We've had a long going segment uh, about uh, frontiersmen and, and so forth and 
as we kept on going, you know, you find out about this other frontiersman and these stories that, you know, we all know Boone and Kenton and all those big, mm-hmm. big famous people, but there's so many more and just filling in those gaps of the, the other people, the behind the scenes people who were just, just as important or, and just as involved in, in some of the uh, things going on during the times. Yeah. Um, so you um, mentioned already about the massive amount of documents that uh, you're mm-hmm. going through. Um, where were they at before and how did they come about? How did, I mean, was this a long search for these documents or how did, how did all that come about? Yeah. So, uh, right. We start around the sesquicentennial trying to think of what, 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 what is a project? And by we, I mean, KHS, I wasn't there at the time, uh, my predecessors, uh, and they decide to, okay, we want to build this digital edition. We want to include everything that passes through the governor's desks. Uh, Predominantly, we have found we found somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty to twenty-three thousand documents that we want to use. So, with ten thousand uploaded, there's plenty more to come. Uh, they come predominantly from uh, a few repositories right now. Uh, one, the Kentucky Historical Society. All uh, right, George W. Johnson, one of the governors, his personal correspondence is at KHS, along with another a number of other papers. Uh, as we were talking about before kind of recording started, right? Uh, the Kentucky Department for Library and Archives has almost all of the union governor's papers. Uh, not not all of them, but a sizable number of them. We've also pulled stuff from the Filson Historical Society, uh, the Mary Todd Lincoln House, and um, oh, Maker's Mark Distillery had a family connection that we got some stuff from there. Wow. So a largely central Kentucky focus but it yielded us 20 some thousand documents in those um, that narrow, narrow kind of search of archives. And I had a point. Um, <laughs> so it, it's not fully comfort. Like it, it hasn't touched on all of, uh, the stuff in the state. We, we got the work, we got the documents we could. And we were like, okay, this is a lot more than we expected from these few archives. Let's get them up. Let's get them accessible and make sure people can engage them. Uh, so there is still the possibility, right? Early document and early uh, predict- predictions. Yeah, it's definitely late at night and my brain has decided to, <laughs> to stop stop processing words late at night. Um, um, there's talk about going to Washington, D.C., right? There's a suspicion, a Confederate government of Kentucky, right? The provisional government spends mm-hmm. most of its time not in Kentucky. It starts yeah. in November of 61. It's there until like, early 62 and then kind of gets booted out shows back up in the summer of 62 and then george um yeah richard hawes is basically out in georgia or, or richmond the entire time right trying to cobble together a government well that was a, a question i was i was gonna ask which i i know the answer to it but mm-hmm. you know i assumed getting union documents was very easy but the confederate documents mm-hmm. would be um pretty pretty tough to find yeah, the, the Confederate ones have, have been a challenge. Uh, and part of this also goes to uh, the intention of the project, right? When it started, uh, not only was it to make these documents accessible, right? Kind of break down barriers to access, allow people to engage with documents, right? See the original transcriptions um, and see the, sorry, the original documents and the digitized transcriptions. Uh, but it was also to kind of help highlight those the dominant unionist narrative, right? That despite the aftermath of the war, right, and the kind of the post-war memory that many Kentuckians have, at least in the beginning of the war, and for most of the conflict, the predominant, I mean, I'm, I'm casting broad generalizations, right, <laughs> yeah. uh, as historians tend to do, uh, most Kentuckians are unionists for a majority of the war. And that union, right, is, is viewed on preserving the institution of slavery and preserving the union, right, preserve the nation as it was and the constitution as it is without any changes. That certainly changes by the end of the war with emancipation, the destruction of slavery, the 13th Amendment. Uh, and Kentuckians post-war have a very different view on, right, the events that are happening in Kentucky. But part of the project, right, when it begins in 2010, comes along with scholarship from people like Ann Marshall, Patrick Lewis, Aaron Astor, Chris Phillips, right, that really reorients how we look at Kentucky. And CWGK was part of that conversation, right, and, and continues to be part of that conversation. Um, it, and I guess it should be important to kind of, I had a thought about your last question that I was like, mm-hmm. I need to get there. Um, this is the winding road we're going to go on. Today. Hey, that's all right. Um, that way, all of the documents that we gathered, uh, you can find metadata 
on our site of where they currently exist, right? We just took scans of them. The beauty of this is it makes them available, but also there's still a KDLA, there's still a KHS in the field soon. Um, I think one of the best things about the project is that it's collaborative by nature, uh, both in the way it assembled documents and we also uh, do a great deal of work with other individuals. Um, I don't know if both of you know, uh, there are two other Civil War Governors projects that sprung from CWGK. There is a Civil War and Reconstruction Governors of Mississippi uh, oh. run by Dr. Susanna Ural. Uh, and then there is the, um, the Civil War and Reconstruction Governors of Alabama run by Drs. Leslie Gordon and Julia Brock, um, partners that we've worked with as they got their project started mirroring and as their titles suggest, expanding on what we do. Um, so this is a model that other people looked at and said, oh, this is a cool thing. We want to do more, more with this in other places. And I'll say this, James, I finally got my technological ducks in a row. So I do have the outline open now. Goodness, I'm not, <laughs> technology is not my friend, which is why I do history. But, <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it was very interesting what you about with loyalty and how mm -hmm. in Kentucky, that in itself is very complicated. I know from my own personal experience, I had an ancestor who was in the 24th Kentucky Infantry. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were staunch unionists. They joined the conflict very early on. But there's an 1890 veteran census. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is listed on there as a Confederate veteran. And I think mm -hmm. probably because it became uh, a little more beneficial mm -hmm. to side with the Confederacy by the time we're getting you know, into the period of the lost cause mm -hmm. that around the turn yeah. of the century. But uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting that uh, loyalty in Mercer County, where I work, mm -hmm. there are documents that people leveraged the loyalties of individuals for personal gain. So mm -hmm. If you own a mortgage on the farm and the guy you owe it to is, is coming to collect it and you don't quite have the money, you might pass on that, well, maybe they're a Confederate sympathizer or maybe they're a unionist. And that would buy you some time because they would get arrested and that sort of thing. So it was interesting how people leverage that, not just uh, you know because they feel it in their heart of hearts, but because there were benefits they could draw from that. Yeah, I think that, so my dissertation, right, I talked about, looked at loyalty, or I mentioned it very briefly. Um, it looked at loyalty in Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia. And I've carried some of those ideas with me here. What, what I think about loyalty is it operates more as a, I use it as a lens to see how people understood their world. But I often wonder, and I have had conversations with people over, over time, right? Is loyalty something of a mask, right? Certainly people believe it. And there are certain people, right, who are deeply patriotic, that they are willing and, and to die. They, they, they deem their loyalty so sacrosanct and so important to their existence, right, that they're willing to die and keep fighting or after the war, keep fighting, whether it's to maintain a loyalty to the South that or the nation that they fought for and got destroyed in the Confederacy and they create the lost cause or fighting for the union, right, kind of the union memory. Um, but others use it as a mask, right? They use it as something to... I've also called it like a commodity, right? Is it something that you can exchange? Oh, my son is a loyal soldier. You should appoint him to this clerk's position or something along those lines, right? That I, it has a currency. Maybe commodity is the wrong yeah. way, a word. It's got a currency and it can also be a mask. And I think Kentucky really showed me the fluidity, right? Talking about that Kentucky journey, coming, coming to Kentucky kind of showed me how fluid loyalty can be. And we see this in a couple of instances in CWGK, uh, we have, I was talking about kind of the cooperative aspects of the project. We hire grad students every year uh, with funding from the NHPRC, the National Historic Publications and Records Commission. Uh, they work remotely to do research on annotations for us. Uh, we've got a special issue of the Register of the Kentucky Historical Society or Journal coming out in a couple of weeks, months, sometime. I don't know exactly when this podcast is going up, so I don't want to be like, oh, that's good. Uh, it's coming out tomorrow and it, um, so it is coming out in the near future or it will be out when you when you listen to this, uh, but it is using some of those grad students to write essays on research that they've done either in CWGK or intersected or interesting stories that they found. Uh, one of them is about a, a guy from Russellville, Edmund, uh, no, not Edmund Stevens. Oh God, Edward Stevenson. Sorry. I. Uh, getting names confused. Uh, but Stevenson is arrested in 62 and sent to Camp um, Camp Chase out in Ohio. Uh, and he's arrested, right, for running a vigilance committee. He's the president of 
uh, the, the girls' school in Russellville, uh, but he's also accused of being part of the convention, right? The the provisional governor in convention, uh, but his brother, or no, sorry, his, his nephews believe that he is a Southern rights man, but he's kind of like tepidly loyal, uh, but he promises to James Fisher Robinson, he constantly promises his future loyalty, right? He's like, I thought I was being loyal. I may have screwed that up. I'm sorry, but I'll be loyal in the future. Kind of like your your relative, right? Post-war, right. all the memories are like, yep, nope, he was a good Confederate. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we've come across these, these stories and other instances where individuals may have had Union service and then their obituary is like, but no, they were impressed into the Union Army and they were loyal Confederates or they were loyal to the South. Um, and I definitely think that it is the part of people being, yeah, no, there's a currency. There's a, a value to saying I fought for the right, the right side. And, right. I, and I often wonder how often, right, people go around from community to be like, and I was a loyal member of the 24th and I fought for the union. And then they go to the next town over. That's much more like Confederate leaning. Right. And they roll in and they're like, well, I was one of the gorillas that ran around here and fought those damn Yankees. Right. Yeah. Like I, I certainly think that loyalty is fluid and certainly has a, a currency or a value that is negotiable depending on its place and who, who they're talking to. Right. It certainly can change in its value. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, uh, it's very true. Very, uh, and a very good uh, outlook on, uh, on Kentucky. You know, I often think about how, um, you know, just you know, Kentucky's Kentucky people are very loyal and so forth. Mm -hmm. But, but, um, I, I did have a, another little question going back to documents. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, cause when, when you get the talk about the Confederacy and so forth, like, you know, and you talked about the government of the Confederacy in, in Kentucky, um, uh, do you know about Zoli Coffer County? You know about Zoli Coffer, like, is, oh, Zoli, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 oh, however you say his name, I, <laughs> um, I know about him, I don't know about the count, uh, so the Confederate government yeah. of Kentucky created a county. Uh, and named it after him. Uh, it's it, it was right around the area of where Wolf County would have been. Okay. Uh, if you go to the Secretary of State's uh, website uh, in, in Google search, it, you, it'll actually come up. But it, it's a very interesting thing. But it's one of those things, like you mentioned before, I, I just find it so fascinating. You know, and, and maybe whenever you all are able to get your hands on more Confederate <laughs> documents, you know, those kind of things as you know issues i mean they 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 ran it as if it was a state but yet mm -hmm. yeah it's it's hard for a non or a, re a rebellious state to actually do anything or the, to maintain anything right and especially when they don't have the apparatus right to run right right frankfurt the technically the revenue collections most of the like the state arsenal most of the ability to manage a government is in the power of unionists. Mm -hmm. uh, and even Brian McGoffin, right, who is, oh God, he's a tepid, he's a tepid unionist and a te he is a little bit of an ambivalent secessionist, right? At least while he's in office, he's definitely not strong enough of a unionist to please unionists. He's not enough of a Confederate to please Confederates. So McGoffin's just kind of this awkward, like nothing burger in the middle, <laughs> um, which is just a really, unfair way he, he's also just really bad at most of the things he tries to do um uh but he at least has the structure right and like the military like uh power is robbed from him but the, the government still has a structure for the union side um predecessors on cwgk right would basically say the confederate government functions just by like stealing guns and kicking doors in right yeah. like they're basically just robbing homes to fund their government and it's it's not a terribly effective system, um, yeah. That, I think that's probably the best way to say it, right? They're yeah. they're just really like kicking doors in, they're stealing stuff, and they're they're robbing their way across southern portions, and it affects some people too, right? Like the Confederate comes, the Confederate government comes in, and they're like, "We're this is your taxes, this is what you owe us." Then, right uh, after Mill Springs, uh, Grant rolls through, right? They abandon Bowling Green. Mm -hmm. Kentucky state collectors come through and they're like, you owe our taxes. And they're like, but we are, we already paid. We, we paid. And it's like, well, no, you, you didn't pay the right government for your taxes, <laughs> uh, which probably irked some people like 
the wrong, definitely irked people. Mm -hmm. Definitely. <laughs> paying, paying your state taxes twice. I can kind of understand how that would. <laughs> yeah, at least at the time we're filming this, right? Tax season is coming up. It probably, <laughs> nobody would want to have to do that twice. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, um, let's see. Any Anything else, David, you got real quick about the uh, project that you would uh, like to add or ask? Um, uh, the thing I, I would ask in, in addition is going through those papers. Like you said, I, I think it's fantastic to focus on uh, the, the average Joe. Uh, you know, it, it's much more interesting than sort of the great man type of history that we've gotten so much in the past. Mm -hmm. But do you think it is fair to say in the documents that you've read, um, that there is a, a loss. Well, let, me, let me back up. After the Civil War, Kentucky governors seem like they've lost a lot of their power and clout, and mm -hmm. we tend to see regional disputes and we see feuds and that kind of thing. Uh, is that the result of uh, a weakness that was brought on during the Civil War? Is it indecision at the state level? So you mentioned McGoffin, who is, uh, I have to make a disclaimer, is a Mercer County guy. So, uh, but, you know, he, he resigns out of frustration. You've got a pro-union government. And he just doesn't feel like he can get anything done. But even yeah. his successors seem like they complain constantly about federal interference. And mm -hmm. Stephen Burbridge and, and the role that he plays in Kentucky. Does the relationship between the union government and state government weaken the governorship after the Civil War? Hmm. I think that's a good question. And I, I'm, I'm going to tentatively venture, venture into an answer. I think, I think those... I think the, the short answer is yes, um, but I think there's a more nuanced answer there. Um, I think the friction that exists, right, between Burbridge and Lincoln and federal officers, right, and I'll focus especially, especially on Bramlett, right, because he serves in 63 through 60, like September of 63 through the end of the war as governor. Right. And I think you can see with Bramlett a lot of those frustrations. Um, and I think it doesn't, I think there's certainly that friction and there is people in the state who write like the, the narrative of Kentucky kind of retreats from the federal government. It becomes much more isolated and insular. Uh, but I think what it does, and I think this is kind of what your question is getting at, is I think it there's so much friction, right, between people who uh, grow frustrated at emancipation <laughs> frustrated at what they perceive as union occupation or union control of the polls, um, that they specifically grow distrustful of Bramley. Uh, but I think they also kind of just grow, they, they end up seeing the Civil War as an opportunity and the violence that is being doled out, right, as kind of currency throughout the state, as a way to kind of assert local power, um, kind of either get back at rivals or people that they wanted to, or just to kind of carve out a little niche for themselves. And I think like kind of focusing on guerrilla violence, right? Bramlett struggles so hard to figure out how to deal with guerrilla violence that's hop popping up throughout the state, right? He doesn't, he doesn't really have a policy and all of his policies really make things worse, right? He's like, I'm gonna give guns to a bunch of people and they'll go run into a county and my, my scouts will go and they'll take care of the problem, right? And they just go in and shoot up a bunch of people and make things worse. And then he's like, all right, that's it new plan. We'll just shoot anyone who's suspected, just, if anyone's <laughs> suspected of being a gorilla, right? Uh, one of the things I do at KHS, right, I've been building from CWGK is kind of a, a tour of our old state capital, um, focusing a lot on Bramlett. And I'll use one of the quotes talking about guerrilla warfare, where it, it's, I don't remember it off the top of my head, and I should have had it pulled up. Um, but it's something along the lines of um, a man shoots two people he believes are gorillas, kills them or they, they have been wounded from a skirmish. He, he, this man shoots them because he believes they're gorillas and they're just kind of being rambunctious and they're trying to get aid because they've shot and bleeding to death, right? So he shoots them and kills them. Um, he Bramley ends up pardoning the man. His name, um, Foley, I believe is his name. Um, he's a former Union soldier who's a railroad worker, uh, but he pardons him. And, and in his pardon, he's like, basically the, outra the outrages of gorillas on citizens is unbearable. And if if one takes due caution and believes that the, that someone is a gorilla, they should shoot first and ask questions later, right? And it's not exactly what he says, but if it's like if it looks like a gorilla, if it smells like a gorilla, if you think it's a gorilla, shoot it. We'll settle we'll settle the issue of, of the legality of killing them later. Like not that big of a deal, which is a terrible way, right? To to frame um, 
in part, it's to protect Union soldiers, right, who are coming home, whether they're wounded, um, but also at the same time, it's kind of like, this is not making things better. Um, these are random, this is a, getting me a little further away from, from what your question was, but I think decisions like that and actions like that certainly kind of pull not only the state away from kind of the federal government, but I do think you start to see these kind of localities and, and especially kind of divisions between unionists and confederates, even though most of those are repaired after the war. I think you see a lot of fragmentation, which does kind of diffuse power across the state. Yeah. Absolutely. And you, the, the predominant narrative on Kentucky, like we said earlier, is that the Confederate government is seated in Bowling Green for about a year, and then it, it's seated in, in other places in the Confederacy for two or three years, and then it's seated in Frankfurt for the next 40 years, and that's laid, in, laid at the feet of, of Burbridge. And then those guys, yeah. you know, whether that's whether that's a, a fair characterization or not, mm -hmm. uh, it's been the predominant narrative. So I was just yeah. curious to make your view on that. Um, real quickly before we switch, uh, well, I, I say switch topics, but we're, I mean, still talking basically about the same stuff. Um, yeah. But um, where where can people find uh, the, the documents, the information, all that kind of stuff? Where's the best and easiest way to, to get in yeah. touch with that stuff? Uh, the easiest way would be to go to the website, and I wrote the address down so I, I could get this right. Um, uh, uh, HTTP colon slash slash discovery dot civil war governors dot org. Uh, is the easiest way to get there. If you also want, you can go to the Kentucky Historical Society's website, uh, history.ky.gov. And on that website, I'm gonna pop up, just make sure there's a uh, explore, and then you can go uh, explore tab at the top and you can click on catalog and research tools. And there is a link on that page. If you scroll down a little bit, that just says Civil War Governors of Kentucky. You click on that and it'll take you to the web address I gave. Uh, so there are there, Two different ways to get there. Yeah, and uh, we will put the those websites in, in in the description as well. So you should just be able to go down and. So me spelling that out was completely <laughs> unnecessary. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, you, you yeah. good good job. You did well. Yeah. And and I and I should note that it's it's important to mention that it's free to access, right? Like part of the condition of working with KDLA and these other institutions is anyone can use this from your phone. I, Maybe don't use it from your phone. It's a lot to have on your phone. You could access it if you're if you're really listening to this podcast and you're like, I need to get on right now, and you pull out your phone, you can do that. But from phone, computer, um, you can access these documents from anywhere. We're going to pause right there with Chuck Welsko of the uh, Kentucky Historical Society and continue our discussion with some more events concerning the Civil War and how the uh, Civil War Governors of Kentucky Project has influenced that as well. Uh, thanks, thank you again to Dr. Welsko, and thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Welcome to the Kentucky History Channel, where we strive to bring you all the Kentucky history content you want and you deserve. Kentucky is a part of all of us, and we plan on covering all the history we can, from Pike County to Fulton County, from Louisville to Harlan. Here on our YouTube channel, you can find many videos dedicated to different events, people, governors, and places in Kentucky. There's something for everybody. While you're here, if you like the channel, hit the subscribe button and the notification button so you get notified anytime new Kentucky history is available. And if you want to support the channel, we have a Patreon page as well, or patreon.com slash kyhistorypod. You've probably heard about Daniel Boone, but what about the rest of the frontiersmen who came to Kentucky and settled? That's what we want to bring to the Kentucky History Channel, the stories of the untold, the stories of those forgotten. One thing to expect on our channel is great Kentucky content some stories that you've never heard of. The Knight Riders, who began in Western Kentucky. Bloody Monday, the riots in Louisville. The assassination of Governor Goebel, the only governor ever assassinated in the United States. Stories from all over Kentucky, stories that are unforgettable, once you've heard them. You can find out who counties in Kentucky are named after 
and how your county got started. From beginning to end, we plan to document every county in Kentucky, all 120. Reach out to us on all of our social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And also leave a comment on one of our YouTube videos. You can also check out our podcast episodes. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and many more. We're always seeking to find more Kentucky history so we can bring it to you. The viewers, the listeners, we want all the stories and all the events from Kentucky's great history to be told and shared everywhere.